all uh all set to go mic check mic yeah. check all right well welcome back to another episode of super progressive and today we have an amazing guest we have dave seaman joining us today super stoked dave how are you doing i'm all right thank you how are you beyond excited it's about 6 a.m in the morning here in los angeles probably around t- or 6 30 2 2 30 p.m um over in england and uh it's cool meeting up with uh, djs all over the globe it's very exciting yeah it's early start for you on a monday morning sorry about that oh no it's awesome like just the fact that you could fit us in we're super thankful um so you know we're going to talk all about your career today but no place to start no better place to start than the present you have you know post lockdown you have your Celador and Celadoria gigs going, and you just had your first gig at E1. Can you tell us a little bit about the concept of Celadoria and then also how the gig went and how everything's going with it? Yeah, it was great. It was felt, felt like forever we were waiting to actually get it off the ground, what with various lockdowns and having to keep pushing things back and everything. But it was a concept that we'd, we'd talked about before, before COVID hit um just to, just do it to do label parties really to 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 have a bit of a platform for for Steve and I Steve Parry who I, I run the the label with um uh, for Steve and I and, our, and the roster of artists that we have to to be able to to do gigs under the Celador banner but um but to try and you know not just turn up with a with a banner and 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 some DJs and actually have a bit more of a of a concept so we'd we'd kind of um invested into into doing some big visuals um i mean the the branding that we have as a label you know the whole um uh, idea of Celador, the name comes from from the film Donny darko um well, when it's when they talk about the three most beautiful syllables you can put together in the english language being Celador. so that's kind of where we got it from so this whole um you know the whole uh, frank rabbit from from uh, donny darko came into play and that's um so our our logo is uh, is the son of frank he's harvey <laughs> after a while uh, the son of allegedly the uh, love child of, of uh, Frank from Donnie Darko and uh, Jessica Rabbit after a wild weekend at Twilo in the late 90s. <laughs> uh, but, but I can't, you know, it's just conjecture at this point. There's, there's, there was no DNA test done, so I can't prove anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, so, so Harvey is our, is our, uh, our rabbit king, our en- en- enigmatic rabbit king. And uh, so we had some, some huge visuals uh, uh, using Harvey and the whole idea of you know, clubbing is going down a rabbit hole, you know, going on an adventure, a bit psychedelic, um, you know, like the whole, you know, coming when you go into a club and you don't quite know what to expect. And then you come out in the morning and it's all a bit of like, wow, did that all really happen? <laughs> Which was, you know, the, the whole idea of, of uh, you know, uh, of being able to be free and losing yourself on the dance floor and everything. You know, it's an age old clubbing and not even just clubbing, you know, the idea of people celebrating life together you know, goes back as far as, you know, the Druids and the Native American Indians and, you know, the, 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 oh, you know, this has been going on for a long, long time. People gathering together and, and um, celebrating life to a to a rhythm, to a drum. So. Um, so, yeah, so we 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 try to incorporate all that into, you know, into a bit of an uh, immersive experience. So when you come in, you get all this um, kind of, yeah, the, the visuals are really the, the main thing. That's our our um, our thing that we were hanging in. So we, we spent a lot of time getting all that together. And finally, we managed to get the the gig in E1 off the ground when we were, we were opened up again here in the UK, and it went great. We were really really happy, and already got lots and lots of uh, of conversations going on with people around the world about coming and and, and bringing the uh, Celadoria thing to 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 uh, to other dance floors. So very excited, yeah. Yeah, we've actually been talking with um, Dom, who I'm not sure if you're agent or tour manager, but we're. We're working hard to get you here in LA because it would it sounds amazing. We know there's like a rich history of underground dance music here, and you know it's post pandemic. There's a lot of cool stuff going on, so we are working with Dom and some other promoters to uh, to hopefully have Celadoria come to LA. It would be awesome. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Yeah, we. Um I need to renew my US visa first, That's my <laughs> <laughs> which expired through through COVID and I never got around to doing it, obviously, because we, we didn't really know what was happening in terms of things opening up. But now they are doing by by all accounts. I need to get that done. But yeah, we are hopefully going to come back to the States sort of next summer-ish, around about then. So yeah, it'd be lovely to 
to return to LA with Celadoria in tow. Um, yeah, very excited to, um, to, to take that, that concept around the world. When was kind of your first memory of consciously and through our research, like music has been a part of your life forever, it seems like. But when do you remember kind of going into a record shop or listening to a pirate radio station or whatever and getting into underground dance music for the first time? And what were some of those first records that left a really big impression on you? Oh, gosh, uh, it would have been sort of mid 80s time. Um, I mean, I was. Uh, I started collecting records when I was just um, eight or nine or something like that, really. Um, just playing seven inch pop singles, uh, records I'd acquired from various family members. Um, and, um, uh, you know, just just fell in love with the, uh, the whole. Uh, people forget that way back then, you know, you couldn't even hear records, music properly as in a in stereo you know like uh, uh when you all all uh, radio stations were all you know mono and and you know a bit crackly and and you know reception was poor so when you actually got a record you had maybe hear something on the radio and think oh that's amazing when you got a record and you put it on your turntable at home it was like hearing it like this amazing <laughs> sound came out so it really so yeah so finding more and more you know seven inch records as it was at the time was was a very exciting to me and, and hearing it in its full glory um so i started doing that and then and then i went on holiday when i was um set about eight or something and my parents and there was a, a a dj just set up a mobile rig in the uk in the uh, hotel there um and i was allowed to stay up um, and help it and help him he kind of invited me to help him set up and i was allowed to stay up and go to the party as it, as it was in the hotel so um so that was kind of became a dj quite early. i wanted to be a dj quite early uh but this was this was before you know dance music i mean dance music was around of course but i was only you know uh, by the time i started getting uh, really into to being a dj i was like 12 13 and um wasn't old enough to go to nightclubs as such but i did start sort of devouring all that was available to me in terms of we weekly magazines, um, uh, which was pretty much what there was available, really. <laughs> there was a little bit of maybe on the radio where I was growing up in Leeds, there was no dance music on the radio, really, um, uh, at all. Um, you know, it was pop music on um, and and one column a week in Record Mirror, as it was, talked about DJing and DJs and, and more club music, which then I sort of devoured all that. And... Um, so so yeah so my 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 uh, it would have been sort of mid 80s i would have started to become a little bit obsessed with the new york music scene at the time um because new york pretty much was much was the epicenter of of dance music back then with all the clubs the legendary clubs that they had and it would have been things like uh, a lot of the arthur baker productions um i got into break dancing when i was like 15 or 16 and that's kind of really where i got more into more dance music and club music, uh, a lot of electro, a lot of rockers' revenge and and um, Africa Mabata's Planet Rock and and you know I used to re religiously watch Wild Style and Beat Street and all those kind of movies that did all the the um, you know had a lot of electro music and I used to buy all the electro street sounds albums, um, New Order. Uh, I was kind of a bit of a fan of New Order anyway. Um, and then suddenly they became, you know, they started doing some stuff with Arthur Baker and Blue Monday came out. And so that was that was my um, introduction if you, uh, to to kind of more club music um, at the time. Uh, but I was still too young to get into a nightclub. So, um, so yeah, that was it was limited. And <laughs> again, you know, you can Google anything and find out anything and, and be there for days down a rabbit hole learning about certain things as like you probably are now learning about underground dance music back then it was really really limited you know uh, i would probably read that column like three or four times that week because there was no other way of getting any more information about about club music than that one column and and um i think radio one had a little dance show on a sunday night more of a soul show which i used to listen to every week but so yeah very very limited information used to devour it all so you're kind of like nurturing this passion for dance music in any way you can, you say you're devouring it. When did you, um, you know, kind of what age were you and how did you decide to get, cause I'm sure you had to like save up your money and stuff, but how'd you get your equipment to start mixing for the first time? 
Uh, it, it was very difficult, really. I had, I had like a mobile rig. So I was working in some of the pubs and, and I used to do people's weddings and birthday parties and all that kind of thing on the circuit around my local area where I lived. I was the local DJ, if you like. So I was doing a lot of friends birthday parties and but it wasn't really about uh, about mixing. I wasn't you know, I was 15, 16 and I couldn't go to clubs and there wasn't really a, a club culture in my local area this is pre house music <laughs> um so it wasn't until 1987 86 87 when house music arrived that there was any kind of um like you know dance music explosion 80 87 would have been the year that mars and s express and bomb the bass and cold cut and all those producers started making dj sample records so uh, again, this was all flourishing through 86, 87, 88. And by that point, I'd got myself a, a job at Mixmag um, through, through a big twist of fate of, of winning a raffle <laughs> at a DJ convention. And I ended up um, getting it, winning a week in New York at the New Music Seminar in 1987 and um got in on getting on well with a lot of people in the in the music industry dmc particularly who were the people that that's that were that sponsored that um raffle uh, and got offered a job to come down and work for them so i was really very much in the eye of the storm in terms of the uk record industry and what was going on and the explosion of acid house as it as it, as it became known as a culture over here um before i even started thinking about mixing as a dj so I I stopped DJing pretty much when I went down to work for, for DMC and, and just, you know, jumped in the deep end of, of being in the ind record industry. Now, during like 86, 87, 88, what I know to be called the second summer of love in England, were you were you like um, were you enjoying it just in kind of solitude learning about these records or were you in the clubs going and experiencing club culture? I was at that point. Once I moved down to London in 1987, I was 19, so I'm old enough to get into a club then. And of course, I, I started working for DMC, who were the owners of Mixmag, and they had studios there. Uh, so they were making remixes. One of the very, very earliest companies doing regular remixes, before record companies really did regular remixes, they were doing a remix package on vinyl every every month. Uh, and they had, you know, they did the mixing and scratching championship. So it's very much about DJ culture. So I started, I was going out all the time then, um, but not DJing because I was, you know, I was so, I was, I was um, kind of dropped in the deep end. I, I became editor of Mixmag really before, by the time I was 20, um, kind of, while they were trying to find another, another, somebody else to take over after the editor left. And I ended up just carrying on with that. Um, so I became more of a journalist really at that point and go, and of course experience it firsthand and, and, and getting, getting to know all the the you know protagonists of what was going on in in that summer of love in 88 and 89 and and reporting on it and being right there in the eye of the storm i couldn't have been any more lucky really to have experienced it uh, but i didn't actually start djing again until 1990 when the uh when a friend of mine who was my photographer one of my main photographers at mixmag and he used to do a lot of assignments with i used to go and with to places with him he used to take photographs i used to be doing the interviews or whatever or reporting on club nights um he started a night in stoke on trent called shelley's um and that and sasha was the he asked sasha was actually living in his same building gary's building so they were quite good friends. And he asked Sasha who, if he'd like to become resident there. Sasha said he only wanted to do three weeks out of every four because there was other clubs he wanted to play on a Friday. So I ended up doing the other night and then also doing some warm-ups for him. So the first time I played in a club and actually started mixing was um, was at Shelley's. Um, and, I, and because I was working at DMC at the time, they had studios there with Technics 1200s. So I kind of was learning kind of in my spare time when I wasn't working on the magazine, how to mix um, yeah, in the DMC offices there. And so to get myself a little bit of practice in terms of mixing. And I was, I was out at clubs every weekend. So I was learning a lot about how to mix from a lot of amazing DJs on a weekly basis. Um, so, yeah. That, that's really amazing. Um, I want to I just want to backtrack a little bit because I think, you know, fans of underground dance music and fans of DJs are so dedicated and want to know everything. You said that your relationship with DMC 
And thus your relationship with Mixmag kind of began with a raffle and a twist of fate. Do you mind kind of giving us the behind the scenes story of how you actually got connected with them? Like, and what this trip to New York was all about? Yeah, um, I was a member of DMC. So through my teenage years, as I say, you know, I was trying to devour as much as I could about DJing and club culture. And um, and one of the ways that I could do that was to become a member of DMC. So I became a member of DMC, I think, uh, from about 1985, I think, the first time I started to get get by. And, and to become a member, it was a DJ-only organization. So it was a subscription. And when you... When you paid your subscription, you got three three uh, vi- pieces of vinyl every every uh, month, and Mixmag, which was kind of a, uh, a glorified newsletter about DJs, and you know it was perfect for me. It's exactly what I wanted to be getting. So I paid my subscription every month, got some exclusive remixes that you couldn't buy in the shops, and got a magazine. And also they did a convention every year, the DMC convention, which is where they did the mixing and scratching championship finals, and they also gave out a lot of awards and had like you know they had. Janet Jackson come and to accept awards, all sorts of people, you know, James Brown eventually, and oh, amazing, amazing artists come and collect their awards. So I went to the 1987 convention and Camel Cigarettes were the ones who were sponsoring a grand raffle. You fill your, if you took a cigarette off them, you filled your name and address in and went into the hat. And and I came out of the hat first. And made, I mean, I just, you know, never won anything else before. I never won anything else since. <laughs> that was, that was, I won my... Career, I mean, pro- probably with Acid House, what was around the corner and the Acid House culture in the UK, I would have found my way into the industry anyway. But I was so lucky to get in early to be uh, because I won a I won a week in New York at the New Music Seminar, which is uh, was then the equivalent of what the uh, Miami Music Conference is now. Um, you know, it's uh, where all people from all around the world go to, um, you know, do a, uh, have a have a dance music convention, and, and uh, there's lots of gigs going on, lots of seminars, lots of, you know, place place for people, like-minded people from dance music industry to meet. I was 19. I wasn't old enough to get into a club in New York at the time, but I went out there. I had a week out there. I had an amazing time, met a lot of people from the UK record industry and the American side of things, went to some amazing clubs. But on the final day, the reason why I got my job was on the final day, I, um, I'd been out shopping. I went around New York shopping, went to all the record shops. Um, and I went to, we were staying at uh, the Marriott Marquis on Times Square, uh, which is where the convention was being held. Um, I went to McDonald's on Times Square. And uh, whilst I was in the queue at McDonald's, I met a guy uh, from a club who was a security uh, guy from the from the club. He noticed I had my pass around my neck. He said, oh, you're from the UK. You're here for the convention. Da, 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 da. Uh, you should come to to my club. I, I work at a club. I work security on the door there. And, and he gave me his card. I thought nothing of it. Put it in my pocket. Went back to the hotel. There were all the people from the UK industry, from DMC, were all stood in reception. They were all just about to go out for dinner, invited me out for dinner. I was like, oh, I've just just eaten. I've just had McDonald's. <laughs> Whereabouts are you all going? Anyway, maybe I can meet up with you later. And they said, oh, we're going to have some food and we're going to probably go to Nell's. Um, and I said, oh, right, OK, I'll see you there and kind of walked off. And they all just kind of went, thought, well, he's not going to get in because I didn't realize at the time that Nell's was one of the hardest, most exclusive clubs in New York to get into. Um, but he was he was working at the door and Nell's was the guy that had given me his card. Complete, complete fake, complete uh, coincidence. I thought nothing of it and and went down to the to the club, met the guy on the door. He got me in. I was out. Uh, I had a few drinks, <laughs> underage drinks. I shouldn't have. Had, but because I knew the bouncer there, the security guy got after about two hours in the club. Um, there was no sign of anybody coming. It was the last night. We were all flying back the next day. So I thought, oh, forget it. Um, I'm going to go back. As I left the club, um, quite a few people from DMC were all stood on the pavement. They couldn't get in. Um, and they were having troubles getting in. I'd had a few drinks. Oh, come, come. <laughs> I'll meet my friend, Michael. Michael, these are all my friends from England. <laughs> and I remember yeah, they all just kind of looked at me like, who is this kid who's not even old enough to get into a club here, getting us all into a club in New York? Um, so, yeah, a few days later, the people who own DMC, Tony and Christine, ran me up and said, I don't know what we want you to do, but if you can get, get us all into a nightclub in New York, you're our kind of person um, and we can see your passion for, for music and DJing and we'd like you to come down and work for us. So I went down to be a tea boy to start off with. I was just making tea for everybody and I just kind of, fell into 
fell into doing some reviews for Mixmag. And so, so it went. And this was 1987. This was right at the very cusp of everything, of like the electronic music, DJ culture, um, revolution starting. Yeah. It's so cool. And what, what a chance and what a twist of fate. Yeah. What, what were some of, yeah, what were, what were like some of your specific responsibilities with Mixmag in its infancy? You said it was more of a newsletter than anything, but are you writing organizing and then designing the newsletter itself are you pretty much doing everything or what were you doing i mean i'm probably un, un, under cut, un, un, undercutting it a little bit there i mean it was a magazine uh, it wasn't just a newsletter but um they were it was very much like um it wasn't a a public magazine it was very much talking about um dj stuff um and it was very industry led and it was um so there was all sorts in there and it was still coming out of the eighties, which DJing in the eighties was still about people, you know, you know, a lot of like, um, personality DJs, you know, and radio DJs, uh, yeah. you know, telling jokes in between the records and stuff like that. So there was kind of a definite, um, there's a definite change just about to happen as I came down. So I was, you know, obviously they reviewed records and they did talk about some DJ and DJs that were working in clubs, but a lot of it was, um, was still in that old eighties mentality of DJs being the personalities rather than the, the, um, the music makers as, as DJs were just about to come really. So, yeah, so I started, I was the young new boy who was really riding that crest of a wave of the new thing that was happening. So, um, so I, I just started doing reviews really, um, re record reviews and then, and then went to a couple of clubs and maybe talked about to, to a couple of the DJs there uh, maybe did a little interview with them and 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 as it was just all just changing and um, then within six months of me being there the old editor left quite quickly and they were start and and so I was kind of thrown in the deep end to kind of do more and more and try and get a magazine out that month while they were trying to find somebody to replace him mm -hmm. they didn't find somebody a perfect person to replace him and that went on for a couple of months while I made the magazine happen once one time and made it happen another time and eventually uh, Tony said you know what you're doing a good job we're just going to let you carry on with it um you know we can tell that things are changing um and you are you know right in the yeah you know right on on it on that kind of thing so um so yeah we 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 tried to change the magazine a little bit there from into bringing in the the whole idea of the, this new DJ spins. This everything changed when people started turning towards the DJ. Wow. Everybody started facing the DJ all of a sudden. It was like the DJ was the focal point of the night, um, and that all happened around around about that time, eighty seven, eighty. Because otherwise, people went in clubs before that. People weren't all facing the DJ. He wasn't the focal point. He might have even been tucked away where somebody can't, couldn't even see him. Um, and then all of a sudden, as, as Acid House culture exploded, the DJ became the focus and what he was playing. And, and um, yeah, that was, as I say, 87, 88, 89. Everything, social, the social landscape of the UK and eventually the world completely changed. You know, um, if, you were, if you were going into a different city in the UK pre 80, 88 uh, and you came from a different city and you went into somebody else's city it was likely that you might end up in a bit of trouble they might hear your accent you know there were you were is that it was you know territory kind of thing and it was the you know football hooliganism and stuff from the 80s and it's it, you know it's animalistic really it's territorial neanderthal kind of way of thinking um and then all of a sudden there was a real community uh, built from dance music and from DJ and then all of a sudden you know people were traveling all over the country and embraced where are you from well you know da, da, da. and that changed really quickly in in the space of well in space of one summer really over there over 1988 very very quickly um, and all of a sudden yeah you could travel all over the country people were going out here there and everywhere um, without fear of you know being embroiled in some sort of trouble they weren't looking for it's cool my I think well, one of my favorite films of all time is 24 Hour Party People, which is all about Manchester. And the kind of the climax of that film is when Tony Wilson's explaining how the clubbers turned to the DJ for the first time. Yeah, yeah it's really, really interesting. Did you, did you, um, when you were a clubber, did you, were you one of the ones that were traveling, were you traveling all around as well, going to different cities? 
Yeah, I was going all over the UK because I was, you know, as the editor of uh, right. you know, dance, dance Music Magazine. So so they wanted me to go to their clubs and then report back and talk about their clubs. And, um, you know, I had access to all these DJs because I was, you know, they, they were all getting Mixmag and they wanted to be in Mixmag. Um, totally. And of course, by 1989, we launched Mixmag to the public and it became a public dance music magazine and the voice of the clubber. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I was going out every every weekend non-stop and sometimes a couple two or three gigs a weekend and i used to go to the hacienda religiously in manchester on a friday night to watch mike and mike pickering and graham park um um yeah that was where i really cut my club in teeth really through uh, uh, as soon as i'd as soon as i'd started at the mc i was up there almost every weekend yeah so cool i got the chance to go to manchester two summers ago and even though you can't go inside the club, it's still awesome to be able to see. And there's a plaque there, but like see where all these buildings and the birth of club culture all happen. It was really cool. Um, so I have a couple questions. I want to. So like Shelley's, according to or Shelley, according to my research, you started there. You started your residency there in 1991, and I'm not sure if that's or nine, I'm not sure if that's correct. But my question is. Um, were you like, when you started this, res when you started this residency, did you already have a reputation because of Mixmag or was your name not really well known, even though you were the one doing, making a lot of stuff happen for Mixmag? Uh, I didn't really have much, any uh, reputation as a DJ particularly, cause I hadn't been DJing for a few years and, and my DJ in career prior to that was very localized in a little suburb of Leeds so nobody really knew me on a on a, on a national basis um it was 1990 actually 19 uh, August 1990 we uh, Shelley started and I went to the first week uh week there because I say Gary was a good friend of mine who was the promoter who was, who was my phot main photographer head photographer at uh, Mixmag so I went there and I was soon I, yeah I started DJing there we, yeah without any kind of reputation but I did have access to all the best music because I was a editor of Mixmag um and um that's really cool yeah so i was uh, I, I, again i was very lucky i had access to all the best uh, all the equipment at dmc so i could practice a lot um on on you know good equipment and then and then access to all the all the latest music and also at that time i was started to make music as well um with steve anderson as brothers in rhythm who was a who was also uh, working at DMC as a, in the studios downstairs. He he came and did a lot of writing for Mixmag for me, and I was going downstairs and started making productions with him. So, in 1990, we made Peace and Harmony, which was the very first Brothers in Rhythm record. And then before the end of 1990, we'd made such a good feeling. So I was I was also making music that was quite big in the clubs at the, that for those specific clubs. So that kind of elevated my name as a DJ as well quite quickly because it was like oh it's the guy that made made that track yeah so um, so yeah from 1990 yeah towards the end of 1990 those, those few months it, it kind of did uh, escalate quite quickly for me and I was getting invited to go play other clubs around the country and. Uh, and again, I think, you know, obviously being being the editor of the magazine at the time that that was, you know, I'm under no illusion that really did help in terms of me getting more more DJ work because they wanted, wanted me to come and, and DJ their club and hopefully write about their club as well at the same time. So we spend a lot of time talking to clubbers who are, you know, like a, of your generation. So a lot older than us now, but they really look back fondly at the Shelley's era and that specific time. My question is, when you were DJing at Shelley's and Sasha has three Fridays and you have a Friday, did you know something magical was happening in the club at the moment? Or was it more, this is just how things are and then looking back you realize, wow, that was really a special time? Um, yeah, I mean, it was amazing time and we did know that it was, we were having an amazing night on a weekly basis but that was Shelley's wasn't the first time that that happened you know at the Hacienda through 1988-89 was was like that every week you know uh, yeah we, I was well aware of what was happening in the UK it was amazing times as I say you know the whole social landscape of the country was changing um, and the fact that you could travel up and down the country and go to all these nightclubs and and be warmly received by 
by the people that live there, but also all, all these other people converging from all around the country. It was like a pilgrimage, you know, to, it wasn't just people in Stoke that were going to Shelley's or people in, you know, Manchester that were going to the Hacienda. But it was uh, an amazing time. We had, ama there was amazing music being made. It was, it, the thing is, it was all very new. And when something's brand new like that, and we're talking about a, a revolution, a cultural revolution, um, um, not seen in 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 the UK since maybe New Romanticism a few years earlier, or punk before that, or mods and rockers before that. We were pretty good actually, uh, the UK in terms of making a, a movement out of out of music cultures. It was one of our best exports, really. <laughs> uh, um, and um, I think we all at the time. I think we saw Acid House as it became known, you know, people think sometimes Acid House is a genre, which it is, I suppose, but it's also for, for people of, of that generation, Acid House was the whole culture, rave culture was Acid House. And it was it was a, the next youth movement that was happening. And it's, we seem to have, have been having them every few years and, and it was the next one. And I think we probably all thought, oh, there's another few, five years in this, like there was in New Romanticism or there was in Punk and when, you know, but actually, of course, it's it's, it's been more like rock and roll, actually. It's, it's just been carried on for 30 plus years now um, and just keeps getting repackaged for the next generation. It's the electronic version of electronic of rock and roll. Rock and roll was built around a guitar and acid house and house culture was built around a sampler and, 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 and um, uh, you know, equipment and uh, technology. Um, so, so yeah, um, I, we were aware of there was something special was going on, but I don't think we ever, any of us realized it was going to be going on for decades. Wow. Um, yeah. Um, to kind of wrap up, like my questions about Mix Mag, one thing, one monumental thing that you guys accomplished was Mix Mag Volume One featuring Carl Cox, and this is this is remembered as, and correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the first commercially available uh, mix albums. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about, about how that idea came to be in the execution of it? Yeah, well, at the time, at the time, you know, this was all very, very underground. Um, you know, what was going on, it was all a big secret. I think that was part of this, what made it all so special, these clubs that weren't, you know, it was not something that the, the, not, the media knew generally about. And it was all word of mouth and, and the music was being passed around by, cassette tapes you know djs being recorded when they were doing their sets and then you know they'd be passed around and and taped you know copied and copied and copied and um and sometimes djs were selling cassettes of their sets of, to top up their money because they weren't getting very paid very much at the time um so dmc was because dmc what they did um of course they did as i say with these these vinyl albums that they used to used to um, sell as part of the subscription service. They had a license to, to remix um, tracks and, and do mega mixes, do mixes of, of people's tracks. It was legal. It was done, but it was a subscription only. It was DJ only. You couldn't sell them through the shops. Um, but they did have an in with, with, the, with the powers that be in that, in that respect. Um, so they had license with PRS and PPL um, and so on and so forth. So, so they realized that actually, you know, the bet would be great because obviously when people were doing it illegally and it was all bootlegs, these cassettes, nobody was getting paid, you know, um, none of the artists whose music it was and other DJs. So they quickly realized that they they were probably in a good position to license all the tracks through their through through their uh, contacts with with uh, with the uh, UK industry, music industries. Um, uh, the, the 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 powers that be in that in that sense um and 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 make a, a commercially available thing that you could actually sell through the shops so yeah so mix mag live volume one was as far as i know that yeah it was, the, it was the very first commercially available dj mix compilation um and yeah i did i did one heart one side of it and carl cox did the other side of it and of course they went on to to do many more uh, uh, mix mag live uh, compilations with lots of other amazing djs uh, and after the off, off the back of that, then then the whole mix compilation uh, very very quickly um, escalated and, and became a massive massive uh, industry uh, <laughs> in the UK and around the world. Yeah, um, you know, I have we'll we'll get to the rent, your contributions with Global Underground and Renaissance very soon. I kind of want to talk about Brothers in Rhythm because it's really cool to me because when researching 
um, you kind of, it seems like you went through this experience that a lot of DJ producers go through where you have a dedicated fan base, very dedicated to the underground sound. But as a musician, you're making music that you think people, you know, music that people want to listen to and want to hear. Can you kind of talk about walking that balance with brothers in rhythm of being like pop conscious, but also an underground sound? Yeah, well, uh, to be honest, uh, when we made Peace and Harmony and, and we made such a good feeling, there wasn't any other reason. I was just making it to play. Uh, Peace and Harmony was made to play at the Hacienda. Such That's a good dance floor. Yeah. <laughs> it's just okay. simply a track made to play for that dance floor and, and such a good feeling was made to play at Shelley's. Um, uh, they, I wasn't thinking of anything else in terms of, you know, being a, becoming a pop hit, which it eventually did. And that was just simply because the whole explosion of that culture happened and it, it, it you know, it spread like wildfire really. Um, and then all of a sudden these records were making it into the pop charts because there were so many thousands of people going to these parties on the weekend, these illegal raves in the fields around the country, you know, with 20, 30,000 people all are here in these records. Uh, they all went and wanted to go and buy them. So, yeah, so, so the, it became pop music by default. It wasn't made as pop music. It was made as an underground dance track. Um, and then as, as Brothers in Rhythm escalated, um, you know, such good feeling became... Chris Lowe from the Pet Shop Boys, it became his favorite record of the time. And all of a sudden we were being invited to remix for the Pet Shop Boys and and co-produce with them very quickly as well. Um, so talk about, you know, being dropped in the deep end again very, very quickly. The first artist we ever worked with in the studio was the Pet Shop Boys, <laughs> who at the time were two of the biggest, uh, you know, was one of the biggest artists in the country, if not the world. And two, you know, two, two heroes and icons to me and Steve. And we're in the studio with them, you know, I, crazy to think of i mean but at the time it was all just oh yeah we're just doing that we're doing that um and and so we we were making at that point then you are then you're making pop music right but i was always a pet shop boys fan i was always a fan of pop music to, to a certain degree um and you know as i say like new order and people like that they were they were bands that were going in the pop charts as well so um dance music suddenly became pop music um and and we did do a re lot of remixes for a lot of artists big name artists for new order and for michael jackson and janet jackson and and david bowie and 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 so on and so forth um because a lot of the big artists wanted a piece of this new you know it, it was like rub you know rubbing electronic music culture rubbing off on them was a was a little thing that they wanted and, and having club mixes that was being played in the clubs was a was a cool thing for a lot of uh, pop artists so um so yeah so we ended up working on a lot of stuff that was maybe considered more pop but it was all driven by the dance floor it was all driven by me wanting to play out at the weekend uh, we did do some other pop stuff as well that wasn't necessarily for me further down the line but certainly that period like late, late 80s early 90s was all driven by making records for the dance floor we can kind of take this a couple of different directions but one kind of standalone question i had was was it did you ever have a chance to like you know, one club or one promotion that we learn a lot about and read a lot about is Up Your Ronson with Dave Beer. Did you, did you like, um, was it cool going back to Leeds and playing gigs as a bona fide DJ? Yeah, very much so. Um, uh, I'll just correct you though. Up Your Ronson was, uh, wasn't Dave Beer. Dave Beer used to run Back to Basics. Oh, back to Basics, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Get, up, your get, was, up your ransom was another another club in leeds that i did play for yeah it was another one of the big clubs in leeds i did play for dave i did play for up your ransom um a few times and yeah going back to leeds was amazing um uh, and a lot of my friends um from leeds who i went to school with were coming to the hacienda with me and going to shelley's with me so i used to go back and and hang out with all them and and they, so they were aware of what was going on in Leeds. And, and yeah, I ended up going back and playing. And yeah, it was lovely to go back to my hometown because when I left my hometown, it, you know, there was no dance music really in, in, in Leeds, really. I mean, the warehouse was going on. It was kind of rare groove and that kind of thing. But um, but yeah, it exploded like, the, like, the, like the, all the other big cities in the country exploded very, very quickly. As I say, the whole scene spread like wildfire fly, fire through through 88 and 80, 89 by, you know, it was it was blanket across the country. All the little towns, little towns in the middle of nowhere, all, all of a sudden had, had house music nights on a on a Saturday night, let alone the big cities. Really, really cool. Um, 
So how can I ask, um, how did your relationship that would go on, you know, to span an entire, almost an entire career, but how did your relationship with Renaissance begin? Uh, well, Jeff, who, who runs Renaissance, um, he used to go to Shelley's. You know, so I knew, I knew Jeff from Shelley's and when Shelley's kind of closed or kind of got, started to get a little bit, you know, a bit tired. Uh, once, once you've got something special going on, it's very amazing at the beginning. You've got all the, the cool cats going and it's all very secretive. As news spread, in general, this you know, is how things happen. When everybody around, around the country starts to get to hear about it, then the cooler people go somewhere else. <laughs> and, you know, maybe the clientele towards the end of 1991 was people who weren't really there weren't as well they were there still for the music and for, for what was going on but it wasn't so much the trendsetters so much the people that were really making things happen so um yeah so Shelley's kind of fell away a little bit and there was more trouble with the local police and all that kind of thing you know the the, the secret had been spoiled a little bit right so actually wasn't enjoying it so much um so yeah so Jeff decided that he was going to start a new night somewhere else that, Sha that Sasha and um, and, you know, myself and, and John Digweed and, and uh, yeah, he had lots of, of people come play at Renaissance, which he opened in 1992. And again, that was another one I made, made the Mighty Ming Brothers Love Dubs was made specifically for Renaissance's dance floor. Uh, so, yeah, so he, he, he started at Venue 44 in Mansfield in 1992. It'll be their 30th anniversary next year um, as Renaissance. And that's where I started. My relationship with Jeff, even though I knew him from from you know from the dance floor at Shelley's, um, it, that's when he started as a club promoter, and I started going DJing for him, and um, and it went on 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 from there, and, and I'm still working with him to this day. Yeah, definitely. It's so cool to me that you're making specific songs for a dance floor, and like we have the opportunity to go back, listen to these tracks, and actually learn about the culture of the club that the track was made for by listening to it. It's really cool, and you can hear like the progression of the music. Now, one thing that we've learned across our interviews, you know, with Anthony Papa, Danny Tanaglia is, um, and I just learned this, but you started Stress Records. That's right, yeah. How, first of all, how do you have like the brain span and the bandwidth to start all these different projects and you have so much stuff going on, but also when did, when did you decide to start Stress amidst everything else going on in your career? Um, just sort of to what, I mean, I'd been at Mixmag for about three years and then I'd started DJing at Shelley's and I was getting more and more offers of work for DJing and Brothers in Rhythm was taking off. So I realized that I couldn't do all of them. Um, and after three years of being, uh, you know, editor of Mixmag, um, I didn't have any, any journalistic, um, uh, credentials really. I was just, um, a fan really and, and, and driven by passion and enthusiasm. I didn't have any um, qualifications as such. So, um, uh, so I realized that at the time, maybe it was good for, to bring somebody in with a little bit more journalistic experience to kind of take mixed mag onto the next level because it was becoming a, a public magazine that everybody wanted, you know, to, to the more corporations were getting involved with advertising and all that kind of thing. And, and, and because the other parts of my career, we're taking off, which I enjoyed more the DJing and the, um, and the music making. I, uh, I decided to, to get, get a couple of my writers, um, uh, David Davis and Don Phillips actually was the, was actually the, um, the assistant editor who took over from me and Nick Gordon Brown from uh, the, at, uh, at Mix Mag. And I, and then we, uh, also it made sense for, DMC to start its own record label because we were getting sent a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of producers working out of the studios there and we were getting sent a lot of music and we had access to, pro to uh, pressing records because we were doing that anyway. I'd have been doing that for years. I'd have all the, all the necessary factors at our disposal to, to easily start pressing our own records up. And, you know, the whole white label thing was very big around record stores there and people wanting underground music um, on white, on limited edition white labels. So we, yeah, we, we, we just, there was a, a, a producer there at DMC, Phil Kelsey, who was PKA, um, who made a record. I said, oh, that's, that'd be massive. We should, you know, if you, rather than start sh shipping it around to record companies who probably didn't understand what was going on quite as much as we did. <laughs> we thought we could do it ourselves a little bit. Um, 
So we started Stress without any grand plan to turn it into a massive record label, just as a as a uh, as a way to put out some white labels to start off with. But that quickly um, that quickly escalated as well. So so yeah, the making the music, the DJing, and the record label all kind of went well to, with each other. I was getting a lot of demos sent, which was great for me to have you know um, exclusive music um, and. Uh, so yeah, so it all sat side by side. As I say, DMC had everything we needed to run a record label, um, and the studios and the DJ, and it all it all was it all went hand in hand. Um, so so stress started, I think, around nineteen end of ninety one, just as I was finishing with Mixbag, around Mixbag to October ninety one. David David and Dom took over from November ninety one, and that's when we first put out stress. So one kind of took over from the other a little bit. Really, really, really cool. Um... And it's cool that like stress became an avenue for so many other DJs for you to get connected with so many other DJs. It's like you look at the, you know, the discography of it and you're pointing out like the who's who of like the progressive epic house era. It's awesome. One, one huge part of Anthony Papa's story was him, you know, opening up for touring DJs in Melbourne. And then he said he got a gig with stress in London and allowed him to come over and make the trip and, and start his DJ career in England. Like, so cool. Yeah. I mean, I met Anthony when I went on my first trip to Australia in 1993, um, Anthony and, and Phil K, um, God rest his soul. And, 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 um, so yeah, I kept in contact with them and, and, um, and then he yeah, eventually he came over to work for us at DMC. Yeah. We brought him, <laughs> brought him over. He had a couple of gigs and this, and he said, Oh, you know, if I'm going to further my career, I realize I've got to be in Europe. Australia was a long way away. Still is a long way away. Um, so he came over, moved over and we, I got him some work there at DMC. So, so yeah, a lot of people went through the, the DMC kind of that, that building there, um, and stress and every, you know, I mean, we got, I got Sasha, you know, some of his first remixes to do some remixes for DMC, um, and and then for, for obviously for for Stress as well. John Digweed went through his first release was on Stress. Um, Tanaglio, we got we had to do some remixes, and um, so yeah, it was it was um, it was a, yeah that building had so many things going on with you know the the um, access to the biggest magazine at the time, access to studios, access to be able to do these amazing remixes for big name artists because they were doing that from before um, the whole DJ culture thing took off. So, yeah, so a lot of big, big names went through, went through that building. And I was very lucky to be a big, be a part of it for, for, uh, oh, I don't know, 14 years. I think I was at DMC. Uh, yeah. I'm sure when they met you uh, in New York, they couldn't have imagined what the future for you and DMC and everything you'd bring to it would uh, come to. It's pretty cool. <laughs> Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was good for both of us. Definitely, I mean, I got a lot, a lot out of it, and and um, was able to bring a lot to to uh, to to them as well. I think in terms of being the being the guy, the young guy who just came in, and then of course, as I say, there was lots of other people that came in and followed me, and we were all, you know, we were all living the dream, really, we're, all of us together, and it was a very, very, um, very, very cool period of time for uh, for to, to be a part of that. Yeah, totally, bro. So kind of like how our, as I was explaining before the show, like how our journey learning about this history of underground dance music began, it began with Global Underground and us understanding what Global Underground, you know, was all about. Um, and we have, we have your Melbourne and your Buenos I or no, yeah, Melbourne and Buenos Aires. Uh, releases here in the studio. We listen to them all the time. And I just have some questions kind of about those specific releases. One, I think every DJ we've had on the show mentions Buenos Aires as a very special place that embraces underground dance music. Now, can you kind of tell us a little bit about your decision? It's your first global underground to bring it to Buenos Aires and then what the party was like? Yeah, I think I'd just been to, I started to do quite a lot of traveling. I was very lucky to, to, to do all, start doing all these international gigs through the mid nineties. Um, and then quite, and, and, you know, global underground obviously started as we, as we talked about before in terms of doing these, these, uh, these illegal cassettes <laughs> as boxed, they were called before. And, and then they realized that they could, they could do it properly officially because Jeff had done Renaissance 
volume one with Sasha and John as a, a mixed compilation. And then they realized Global Underground really realized that they could they could license all the tracks properly. It was becoming a, a business that, that everybody could could do officially rather than having to, to you know be selling cassettes out the back of a of a of a car boot <laughs> or a car trunk as you say over there um um so um um so yeah so buenos aires was um one of the places i think i went to for the first time in 1998 and it just was incredible the the energy and the passion of the the south american crowd there and particularly buenos aires was uh really blew me away so when I got approached by the Global Underground guys to to do a, a CD for them, compilation for them, it was it was my instant thing. Oh, we've got to, we've got to do Buenos Aires. That was amazing, guys. You've got to come to Buenos Aires with me. Uh, and it was it was an incredible night. And has gone on to be, you know, it's it's clubbing capital of the world in a lot of respects. Is is uh, is Buenos Aires? I mean, you know, you could talk about Ibiza and we could talk about Berlin and and other other big big cities, but. Um, the passion, uh, the size of the underground um, scene there. And, you know, Ibiza obviously is a very um, seasonal thing. You know, it's a holiday destination. Buenos Aires is a year round um, clubbing capital where, where it's just like it's and in, it's really underground. It's never really sold out. There was quite a lot of places that did go quite commercial post the uh, post the uh millennium um and it's always retained its real underground roots and have really thousands and thousands of people going to party there and and but it still retains a very very um discerning um knowledgeable crowd um that's just a pleasure to play for and, uh, and they've never that's never really changed since first time i went which is almost 25 years ago now um so yeah, I'm very lucky. I'm glad that I managed to get in and do Buenos Aires before somebody else did, because I'm sure <laughs> it wouldn't have been long before somebody else was doing it. Uh, but yeah, that was my first first of um, of the four global undergrounds I did, and and uh, yeah, it's always a it's always a pleasure to get to go back there. It's one of the one of the highlights of uh, as 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 you've alluded to there. I think most DJs will tell you any time. It's one of the best places to go and DJ. Yeah. Totally. And when, when you're making these mixes for Global Underground, you're going to these crazy cities and every DJ kind of treats the mix as something different. But my question is, you know, you're there's like there's the city is such a big part of the mix beyond just the packaging, but it goes into the story, the album notes. Did the city affect your um, your like song selection at all or were you really just playing the sound that you were playing and trying to drive forward at the time and you would have played the same set in any city that you were in um there was there's there was definite cultural differences at the time um between you know um say 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 buenos aires say buenos aires and and um i don't know like Tel Aviv or something, which actually are really close, more closely knit now. But at the time, probably Buenos Aires, you could be a little bit um, uh, slower, maybe in your build up. It was, you know, this kind of that slower, sexier vibe going on. And, you know, the people don't really go out until like really late. They have late dinners. Uh, you know, the club might not even really get busy till two o'clock in the morning, but they were all still there till seven. Or, or like somewhere in the UK, which, you know, was finishing at two o'clock or three o'clock, a lot of that, you know, uh, may, well, by that time, by late 90s, more like four o'clock uh, there. But the license has got a little bit later, but the UK was still used to cramming it all in really quickly. People get in there early. And so there was differences in terms of how the night panned out. But overall, you know, the sound that we were playing was the sound that people wanted to hear around the world. So you didn't really change it drastically you know people what people booked you because they wanted you to come and play your thing you know they didn't want you to change it to try and make it different for them than what they was somewhere else you might as i say you might make it slightly slightly tailor it depending on how the night was was uh um uh was pans out how it was um you know um i was done in terms of times and how long you had to play and and, and all that kind of thing and Maybe, as I say, like uh, the history of somewhere like Tel Aviv, early doors, you know, they were quite fast and furious. There was that sort of goa feel going on there. So there was little cultural differences. But um, but no, overall, it wasn't until Melbourne. Actually, Melbourne was one of the first ones that you mentioned there where I tried because I knew a lot of 
producers down there I'd become friends with a lot of producers down there so I tried to make it more I tried to include a lot of them the ones that had actually made they really started to make a name for themselves as producers I wanted to try and reflect all that and and I did get most of the people that I knew down there at the time to to contribute a track um to to the Melbourne album but before that no not so much it was just whatever was the best music around at the time that I could lay my hands on go and have an amazing night playing that music and hopefully be able to license all those tracks not all of them sometimes it wasn't quite so easy that's why we could never really do a a live mix because um you know you'd have to you'd have to clear the tracks before you went to do the gig and sometimes clearing tracks used to take months so by the time you got to if you did that by the time you got to the gig a lot of those tracks would be old you wanted to be playing the brand new fresh stuff so it was always post the gig that we tried to license as many of them as we can and also you got things when you do a live mix i did on the cape town album we had a bomb scare on the cape the night of the cape town album yeah it was a right it was a just a rival promoter that had like tipped off the authorities that you know to try and and sabotage our night so we had to but we we had to be taken seriously the police had to evacuate the building so halfway through my set everybody had to leave the building you know if it was a live if it was a live recording there would have been a big gap there <laughs> and of course when you come back in i couldn't just carry on from where i left off i almost had to start again so the, the mix would have been like very disjointed so um you know you can't you can't um you know legislate for things like that yeah. as it happened as it happened that that was one of the the best things that happened on that night because it was my birthday um so everybody had to leave the the club we were all had to stand outside in the car park well well the police went in and made the necessary checks and everybody was everybody outside was singing happy birthday to me in the car park and there was <laughs> no this really, really kind of communal kind of feeling that we were all in it together and then by the time they said okay you're fine you can go back in everybody rushed in and of course the, from the first record i put, played on the place just exploded you know wow. so it kind of it had the, the opposite effect to whatever the guy that was trying to sabotage <laughs> the night because it actually just elevated the whole night into something even more special in the, in the, in the overall. So, um, so yeah, we didn't do live mixes for many reasons, that being, <laughs> that being one of them. One of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, the licensing was the real problem. You know, sometimes it would take weeks and weeks to, um, to, to get clearance for, to use some of these tracks. So, so you used to just try and, Try to well, obviously re- record the night and re- try to remember exactly how it went. And if you couldn't get something, maybe you had something else that fit fitted in that was that came along after the event that you would have played on the night if we couldn't if um, if we, if it had been available at that time. Um, and just just really give the essence of of the party and and um, and what the feel was of of the atmosphere and 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 the uh, of, of that particular night. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, really cool. My last, my last kind of GU related question is, they started making these awesome documentary, like video documentaries of your trips, and the one they have of you was in Melbourne, and you said that Melbourne was one of your favorite favorite cities in general. It's like a second home. Kind of, what is it about the city that is special to you or special to club culture? And and you kind of want to talk a little bit about Melbourne. Yeah, um, I think the people. The people are what make, makes it a lot of the time. Um, I mean, it's an amazing city in lots of lots of respects, but I got to know and got to strike up a lot of friendships with a lot of people down there. Very, a lot of talented, very talented people. They, um, I don't know whether it was something to do, I don't know, and just generally it's, same, it's the same now. I don't know if it's something to do with the geographical um, aspect of them being so far away from everybody else that they, they feel it's not so much the case now with, with the advent of the internet and stuff, but, but maybe back then, um, you know, when you're kind of a bit out of, out in the middle of nowhere, you almost feel like you have to go the extra, extra mile, extra 20% to get noticed. Um, so they were really, you know, per capita, there were so many talented producers there, which as I say, uh, in, in, for the Melbourne album, I got to, 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 uh, make sure a lot of them contributed to, to that. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I struck up. I, I used to really enjoy going down there. I used to love Chapel Street in particular, which was this sort of uh, uh, a part of a suburb suburb down there, which was some 
Rocks and 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 that's where DMC used to have a shop, the uh, record shop where Phil K used to work out of, um, and and Anthony uh, was was down there obviously, and yeah, Casey Taylor and Jamie Stevens and you know the Infusion guys and I mean you know uh, Gab Oliver and all the Sunny Side guys. I mean Stuart used to run DMC. I had I had a lot of friends down there, Sean Sean Quinn. Um, so it was it was like being home from home, really. I think that was the thing. You used to re- really enjoy spending time there and being wowed by by the, their enthusiasm and by their their talent of all the people that were down there. And and um, and so, yeah, I actually really came close to buying an apartment there on Chapel Street. I wish I had. I bought a place in Ibiza instead, and that was a nightmare. I lost loads of money on it. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um but um but yeah um i just it was just an instant affinity with with uh with the place and the people there uh that that um is still true to this day yeah nice nice you know during in the same documentary you kind of said how the there are no pun intended there are stresses involved with you know being a dj and the dj lifestyle and sometimes the club you were saying how like on your off day the club is sometimes the last place you want to be it's like if an office worker wanted to go to the office on a saturday and sunday can you kind of talk about you know these periods and i and i don't mean to get like too personal but these periods in a dj's career where it's going sometimes it's going well and i imagine other times it's really difficult and really tough um in the documentary you said you got a place in ibiza and just kind of took off for three months and uh and like kind of just, you know, got back into the flow of things. Can you kind of talk about that perpetual flow as a DJ and a career of knowing when to kind of take your foot off the gas a little bit? Yeah, it's difficult. Um, and everybody has their own way of dealing with it, I suppose. But when you, when you, when things are going really well and people want a piece of you all the time and you're traveling, you're, you know, maybe doing, you know, several gigs on a weekend and then, um, and the whole like concept of, of, you know, being at a party, you know, you feel like you've got to join in with that party and, and people want you to be a part of it. They don't want you, um, you know, just to kind of come in, do you th- be really cold and calculated, to, you know, do you think, take your money and off you go again. You know, you kind of do want to um, embrace the relationships with the people that are, you know, there, the, the promoters and, and, um, and the, you know, the, the, the other DJs and, and, and the people, of course, the crowd more than, more than anything else. So, so if you get involved in that and then you're having a few drinks and then you're on the next one and, you know, trying to deal with not looking after yourself in terms of getting enough sleep and not eating properly. And um, all that is is doable for a little while. But over the period of years, <laughs> if you're doing that every weekend for a few years, then it become it starts to take its toll a little bit. Um, and you have to find time to take care of yourself and maybe get off the hamster wheel for a little while. Especially because, you know, a lot of people think they are DJing. They just do that at the weekend and, you know, and then they've got all week to recover and they go again. But actually, no, during the week, just just, just as incredibly as busy, you know, um, we're, especially now with social media, we're making music, we're running record labels. It's just a, a 24-7 um, job. And under, and under under no circumstances am I complaining about that. Um, you know, that's what we all want we all want to be busy we all want to be the ones that people you know want us to do this want us to do that want us to do the other but it's just uh, but sometimes you just keep you just say yes to too many things eventually and it's just re- realizing when to say no um and and just have some sort of handle on it so it doesn't get all spiral out of control and because that's when you've got too many things on your plate that's when it gets stressful and then and then it's harder to deal with everything when you've had no sleep and you're stressed and and then it just it can spiral out of control and and then you know you can fall off the wagon really really badly by by um going down the wrong road so um it's a really difficult um, balance to strike um, because of the nature of the business. We are in the entertainment business, in the business of having fun. Um, but it is a business at the end of the day. And if you really want to be in it for the long haul, then you have to um, focus on, on on taking care of yourself and and, and the, the long term goal. So, as I say, it's a really difficult, really difficult balance uh, and everybody will have their own way of dealing with it. Um, some people, it's, some people can't do so many gigs all in one go. Um, I think more and more so now it's um, 
it's about having a good team around you. I think that's how the, the big DJs are really managing because they're not doing it by themselves. They're the front person there, but they're, but there's lots of other people doing a lot of, you know, work on their socials and, you know, running the labels and, and their agencies and so on and so forth. And, and it is about having a great team. That's teamwork makes the dream work in that, in that sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's cool. I guess my last, last question of the interview is a funny one. You do, you do a great job with your social media accounts. And one of the consistent comments we always see is Dave has got to have the largest bathing ape collection of clothing in existence. And I was just wondering, like, yeah, I was just wondering kind of, uh, you know, I, I love the intersection of like fashion and club culture and all that. And so how, and you have like some iconic covers with bathing ape on it. Like how did that kind of, how did that kind of start? I, I saw in the documentary, you rep Nike, Levi's and bathing ape. Yeah. 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 Not so much Levi's anymore. And, and maybe <laughs> yeah, I still got some, I still got, I still buy Nike trainers from time to time, but not solely, but yeah, I still do buy a bit of bait. Paul Smith, as I've got older and I've become a little bit more um, uh, gentrified, uh, Paul Smith is good as well. He's a local designer. He's from Nottingham as well. So, okay. um, so yeah, probably more Paul Smith and and I still, uh, and bathing ape. It's Japanese fashion is my thing actually. That's where I've because Paul Smith's massive in Japan as well. He's got so many shops over there, um, and even even things like Uniqlo. Because actually, the guy that started uh, Uniqlo. I started bathing ape is now the the um creative director of uniqlo nico oh, oh. um so yeah japanese fashion that's where it's that's where it stems from and i think that was my love of of uh falling in love with japan um which was another late late 90s thing and the way that they um you know that whole limited edition exclusive very cool thing and the branding of bathing ape and the way that they i mean bape have done like collaborations with everybody. I mean, there isn't a big brand they haven't done a collaboration with. You know, you want to talk about doing Formula One cars and Coca Cola <laughs> and Rolex and uh, I mean, there, are you everybody? Everybody they've done collaborations with. It's just one of the coolest brands uh, ever, really. I mean, everybody wants a piece of of that Bape collection <laughs> uh, collaboration. So. Um, so that was, yeah, something that started in the late 80s and I still collect to this day. I mean, you know, everything from, oh gosh, you know, from 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 the models to... Uh, oh, amazing, yeah. To the, to the mats. <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> so, uh, I got, I've, I've been a bait collector for, um, for, 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 yeah, over two decades now. And, and that's something for the, you know, to take a little piece off for Celador, really, and the whole, um, you know, the whole Celador logo, which I'm sporting yeah. there, you know, the whole idea of of doing um, lots of different uh, collabs as well. I'd like to get into doing that kind of thing. I think, yeah, there is a, as you say, there's a massive connection between club culture and, and, and the music side of it. And I think James Lavelle is another uh, great one at doing that kind of thing, Uncle and Ollie's, Ollie's merchandise. And he's very much a... He loves his uh, Japanese uh, collabs as well. So some of the some of those uh, uh, graffiti artists that he works with, and so on and so forth. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm, um, that's something I'm very very keen on as well. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. It's really really cool. Um, but yeah, bro, thank you so much for for joining us today. It's like we're out here trying to tell this grand story of the history of underground dance music and you can't tell that story without you. So it's, it, it's a super essential piece of our puzzle that we're building and we're really appreciative. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Anytime guys. And uh, hopefully we'll, I'll see you um, in, in LA at some point next year.